I am uh, Doug Schmidt. I was here months ago giving a talk about some topics related to generative AI. And today I'm going to give a slightly different focus on generative AI. And we're going to talk about issues related to the ethical aspects of generative AI. And we're going to start more broadly by talking about technology innovation over time and the ethical implications that those innovations have had. And this will help provide a nice segue into the generative AI discussion because generative AI can be viewed as a further course of history with respect to technology innovations. Key point, technology innovations have long had ethical impact and implications. You don't have to go very far, for example, to read the work of J.R.R. Tolkien discussing Middle Earth and see his perspective on the impact of technology and he had a rather uh, traditional view of things. He wasn't very happy about industrialization, for example. And if you read his work, you see that. And if you watch the movies, you'll see that too. So if you take a look at what's happened over the past thousand years or so, there's a number of innovations that are worth discussing in the context of ethics. And as we'll see, each step forward was also a double-edged sword with respect to some of the impacts they had on ethics and society and culture and so on. So let's start back a long time ago, 500 plus years ago, with the creation of the printing press, which was Gutenberg's great innovation. And this had a very transformational impact on society, this, this innovation. For example, one of the things that could happen with the printing press was it was much easier to spread misleading information than it had ever been before because you could print things up and you could disseminate them and people would be, would be swayed by that. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff about the great moon hoax of 1825 where people claimed that there were some kind of creatures living on the moon and because they could disseminate that through the printed paper and printed form, the information spread much more rapidly. We'll come back and see other aspects of fake news later. Something else, of course, that had a big impact was the ability to disseminate information and ideas that had a big disruption on the social order. So if you're familiar with the history of the Protestant Reformation, a lot of that was possible because people could make printouts of things like Martin Luther's 95 theses that he nailed to the church door in Wittenberg, I believe, and it was able to spread the information much broader. And of course, there's also lots of good things that come from the printing press as well, but I'm focusing here primarily on the things that, that give us pause and think about the other aspects. A couple hundred years later, the steam engine came along, also very innovative, changed a lot of stuff. It enabled people to be able to travel much longer distances than you could go easily with horse-drawn carriage or by walking, and so it connected things together. But it also had some other side effects that we still deal with today. So, for example, once steam engines were created, there was a need to power them. And the most common way of powering them back in the early days was through coal. And I think we don't have to look very far to realize that that had some negative effects. There's some great examples of what happened in London because of the use of soft coal, so-called soft coal, that caused a great amount of pollution, especially when combined with other things like damp, cloudy, London weather and England weather and so on. So we still wrestle with a lot of this stuff today and there are various efforts to try to address fossil fuels and so on. And the steam engine can be looked at as a driver for a lot of that. Something else that happened, which we actually have a connection with here at Vanderbilt, is the advent of the so-called robber barons. And these were people like Cornelius Vanderbilt and Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller who made a lot of money with railroads using the steam engine to power the trains and they amassed great amount of wealth and power and influence and of course Cornelius Vanderbilt had a wife that had a Nashville connection and that's why back in the 1870s he donated I think it was a half million dollars which was a lot of money back in those days and founded Vanderbilt so we we were the direct beneficiaries from the robber barons but not everybody was as fortunate as that Another big innovation that came about another hundred years later in the 19th century was the 
advent of electricity. I think we would all agree that that's a pretty darn innovative thing and a, and a transformational thing. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be a scholar back in the day when you had to read by candlelight or you could only read during the daytime when it was nice and sunny outside, otherwise it was too dark. And plus all the other things that come along with electricity like indoor lighting and all the other stuff that we just take for granted to power our computers, if nothing else. This also, of course, has some other consequences like using coal and other ways of being able to generate electricity that power plants are sometimes perceived as being a great contributor to pollution, especially air pollution and water pollution. Haven't quite figured out how to do that one at scale yet, but people are getting better with things like solar panels and wind farms, but they also have pros and cons as well as we're learning every day when there are new issues that cause people to, to rethink the commitment to sustainable energy. And of course, doesn't you have to look very far where other forms of energy generation, such as nuclear power, which, which is actually very good in a lot of ways, the downside is when it goes wrong, it goes very wrong. And so as a consequence, people have to be extremely careful with how they use it and how they dispose of the waste. So electricity, again, sort of pros and cons. Now we're getting into the 20th century. This is now in our lifetime. We're still seeing the implications of this with computing and the internet and the World Wide Web and social media and deep fakes and voice phishing and all this other good stuff. So lots of positive steps forward. Those of you who are in computer science or data science can appreciate the trem tremendous transformational impact that computing has had on our careers and our potential and all the in interesting things that are happening in that space. But again, there's not without some concern. For example, there's lots of issues about privacy where companies and, and governments for that matter are able to track what you do, where you go, what your interests are, have a good sense of what it is you're thinking about. Here's uh, Eric Schmidt, no relationship to me, saying, we know where you are, we know where you've been, we can more or less know what you're thinking about, which is, sounds sort of like either Santa Claus or something from a George Orwell dystopian novel. So these are tricky issues that we're still coming to grips with today, especially from the point of view of legislation and regulation. And another big issue that we wrestle with is this issue about unequal access to the technology. So I'm sure you've all heard about the digital divide, which is this, this chasm, this divide between people who have access to technology and know how to use it effectively and those who don't. We're getting better in those respects. More and more people have access to the internet, for example, whether that's good or bad is another story we'll talk about later, but more people have access. Computing devices are pretty ubiquitous. Pretty much everybody can get access to a, a smartphone and be able to access content on the web. Again, there's pros and cons to that, but this is getting better, but we're about to unleash a whole new set of problems, which I call the digital chasm that we'll talk about here shortly as well. And of course, the other thing that we learn with the internet and the web is it's now even easier than it ever was before, than the advent of the printing press notwithstanding, to propagate fake news. And you can disseminate information, both good and bad. This again has all kinds of interesting consequences, especially during an election year. And then finally, we get to the current day, which is the impact of generative AI and augmented intelligence. I'll talk more about augmented intelligence in a second. We've talked about that before, but I wanna recap some of it. And this is where we are today. Obviously, lots of opportunity. We're taking classes on this stuff, having a transformational impact throughout the business sector, throughout the defense sector, throughout the national security sector, throughout education and everywhere else in between. But of course, there's some downsides. It's very easy nowadays to produce realistic content using generative AI that is not, in fact, the people who are speaking and doing things. One of my favorite ways of amusing myself is to watch a web channel by Brian Monarch, where he has all these deep fakes, largely of Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he inserts him into all kinds of famous movie scenes, like When Harry Met Sally and I Love Lucy. And uh, he, they have him singing the love song from Titanic and all this stuff, it's just great. So, but it's amazing and uncanny how realistic this guy can make other characters like Meg Ryan look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And of course, there's also a lot of issues that we're wrestling with here in Music City having to do with intellectual property. Who owns these 
creations that come from generative AI, what happens when artifacts and content is used to train AI systems and then it generates these deep fakes or generates music or generates art. There's a lot of issues that are coming up here. They're, they passed, I believe Tennessee has passed some legislation recently trying to protect artists, but it's still a very thorny and tricky issue. And, and other countries, for example, have decided that copyright means nothing with respect to training. So I believe in Japan, for example, they decided as, as a government that they wouldn't hold people accountable for using copyrighted material to train large language models because they saw it was a competitive advantage to, to not do that. And another thing, of course, that everybody's concerned about and people who are in technology are as, in, as concerned about this as anybody is what is the long-term impact of these changes on the workforce? So as technology and generative AI gets better, smarter, faster, cheaper, how is this going to impact the types of work we do and who does this work and how much of this work is done? And historically, changes in technology usually came at the expense of people who did uh, certain kinds of labor and usually more the, the low end of the wage sector would be affected. For example, when you had robots come along to cook hamburgers that displaced people who used to make money cooking hamburgers as people. But nowadays with the impact of generative AI, I think we're going to start feeling the pinch in more of the, the so-called white collar jobs. Not sure that's the best term, but jobs that are information centric. And so a lot more people are going to feel the impact of these changes. So that's just a quick tour through some of the historical impacts that technology innovations have had on society and some of the ethical concerns that we should be aware of. And the point of view here is this, there's not a right or wrong here. It's about reasoning and thinking this stuff through critically and then deciding where you want to emphasize your time and effort to try to make changes to protect what you think is important with respect to being a human and being someone employed in the workforce.